Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry we're a little bit late, uh, but welcome to today's industry presented webinar, A Tale of Two Proteins, Plant versus Animal for Fitness. A few housekeeping things before we get started. This is a voice over IP webinar, meaning it's totally web-based. There is no call-in number for audio. If you experience audio difficulties or if the video begins to buffer, it's likely caused by the strength of your internet signal. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area within the GoToWebinar navigation, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question goes unanswered, don't worry. We'll take all the questions from today's webinar and turn it into a Q&A blog that will be posted on the ACSM website. We also encourage you to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. Today's webinar is sponsored and presented by the Egg Nutrition Center. ENC is a credible source of nutrition and health science information and the acknowledged leader in research and education related to eggs. One continuing education credit, courtesy of ENC, will be emailed to all participants after the webinar. You should receive the CEC email tomorrow afternoon. There is no need to email ACSM asking about CEC credit. A link to the webinar will also be posted on the ENC webpage for any registered dietitians looking to receive CEC credit as well. Today's webinar presenter is Dr. Chris Moore. Dr. Moore is a nutrition spokesperson and consultant to a number of media outlets and corporations, including the National Dairy Council, General Mills Bell Institute of Health and Nutrition, Nestle, and Nordic Naturals. He is a, consul a consulting sports nutritionist for the Cincinnati Bengals is an, and is also an expert contributor for Reebok One. He's on the advisory board for Men's Fitness Magazine and has written over 500 articles for consumer publications such as Men's Fitness, Weight Watchers, and Men's Health and Fitness. Dr. Moore has a Bachelor and Master's of Science degrees in Nutrition from the Pennsylvania State University and University of Massachusetts, respectively. He earned his PhD in Exercise Physiology from the University of, Pitt of Pittsburgh and is a registered dietitian. With that, I introduce you to Dr. Chris Moore. All right. Thank you very, very much. It's good to be here with everybody today and certainly talking about a topic that, uh, that I love to talk about, which is protein. We're going to talk all about some of the ins and outs of protein. Uh, protein is one of those interesting macronutrients that you know, we, we've seen trends come and go with, with different macronutrients from fat to carbohydrates and so on. Um, but protein kind of seems to be always one of those ones that, that stays head and shoulders above the rest. And we'll talk about some of those trends and look at some different types of protein, certainly why protein matters. Um, so we'll talk about the trends, you know, talk about amino acids, these building blocks of protein and what protein does for us. Um, again, look at some differences between plant and animal proteins, because as we know, there's a lot of different proteins available. Um, and then actually look at some of the, the current dietary guidance on protein sources and certainly amounts. Um, and then lastly, talking about how to meet your client's protein needs and, and help them meet their dietary needs. Um, so one of the things when we see with protein trends, and again, there's, there's lots of different proteins available. Again, when you, you search this, you go walk down every, any grocery store aisle now, and there's a whole variety of protein trends. I'll get a little bit more in depth about that, but why is it that protein, again, seems to be that macronutrient that, that has never had a, a, a bad day, so to speak, right? Fat has been uh, popular and not same with carbohydrates, but protein is super important in the sense of, you know, protein is, is an important component of every cell in the body. And certainly hair and nails are most of, made of protein, as you may see there. Um, it's also an important building block of bones and muscles, cartilage, skin, blood, you know, all these, these amino acids that we get from protein certainly have a lot of different roles in the health of the body. Um, again, you know, what, what a lot of people think of when we think of protein uh, trainers, dietitians, et cetera, often think of the next one, which is your body uses protein to build and repair tissue. Um, again, it's usually often thought of for muscle tissue, which is certainly one, but of course there's other tissues uh, throughout our body. Um, and then it also makes enzymes and hormones and other body chemicals. Um, lastly, you see that last bullet there. I think one of the really interesting points about protein, and it's gotten a lot of uh, play and attention recently in research and in popular press, uh, is that research has shown that, that higher protein diets uh, may also increase satiety or fullness, um, and then ultimately, because of that, may help promote weight loss, um, which again is certainly a, 
a, an important uh, consideration for the you know almost two thir thirds of the population were overweight uh, or obese. So when we look at that, when we think about that, it's not surprising to see how this protein trend continues. And here are just a few different uh, kind of governing bodies, so to speak, looking at the, the protein trends. Um, we have the Nutrition Insights, this you know, special report, 2017 Nutrition Trends, what to watch out for. Um, and again, as I, right, as I mentioned earlier, that, that pre protein health halo continues to shine on, and it always has. Um, now, again, at the, towards the end, we'll talk about you know, what, just because some protein is good does more necessarily equal better. Um, but again, also, you know, Food Business Journal looking at another trend here, the Food Business News, excuse me, the top food nutrition trends on tap in 2017, and once again, uh, it is protein power. And more specifically, you look a little bit more closely, protein's popularity shows no signs of slowing. Nearly two-thirds of consumers in 2016 said they strive to consume more protein or as much as possible according to survey data, which is really interesting when you think about it. And just on the surface, you've probably noticed when you walk into restaurants, when you walk into whether it's, whether it's fast food or quick service or even grocery stores, protein is the main focus now, whether it's the to-go boxes of food that you see at some coffee shops, again, or a lot of snack items and so on. Uh, people are either adding protein to their food to, to capture that trend uh, among the population. Now, with, with getting more specific, I mentioned fats and carbohydrates have kind of been back and forth. What's interesting, getting a little bit more, uh, nailing this down a little bit further with fats. So as a whole, fats have been good and bad. Again, and I'm not using those terms, again, thinking about what the, the consumers think of fat. When I first went to college, uh, started my degree in nutrition, that was the food pyramid was still around. Fat were, fats were the tip of that pyramid, which was the use sparingly category, uh, for those who remember that. Um, and then, again, that pendulum swung the complete opposite direction, and fats became you know, the greatest thing ever. And, and carbohydrates were demonized. Now, of course, we could boil down each of those a little bit further. So with fats, now it's not just fats being, again, quote, good or bad, but the type of fat and we're seeing saturated fat, always thought to be dangerous or harmful for heart disease and so on. But now people are starting to embrace saturated fat. And um, you know, there's some research that, that's come out saying saturated fat may not be as bad as we once thought. Um, so there's different, the different types and kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of the macronutrients. And same thing with carbohydrates. Um, certainly we have whole carbohydrates um, versus the refined carbohydrates. But what's interesting about that is you know, when you look at the diet, 2015 dietary guidelines, um, it, the, the guidelines actually say get at least half of your whole grains or your grains from whole grains. So again, it's, but, but what we see as consumers, we hear some is good, so more is better, right? So again, we need to start to figure out about balance. Um, lastly, on protein, what, what is the trend on protein? Well, it's just, it essentially seems to be more is better. Um, Again, I'm not saying that should be the case, but I guess more specifically than that is looking at different types of protein. So plant proteins um, are certainly uh, making a rise, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Um, but again, the next piece to this is, you know, how much should we eat and what should we be looking for? So plant-based plant protein is certainly a, a popular trend these days, whether it's nuts whether it's protein supplements, as you see on this slide here, these protein-based protein drinks, which are plant-based, lots of bars and other snacks. And you'd see that, that, that particular product there highlighted nine grams of plant-specific protein. I think that's also trying to capitalize on consumers' interest in more of a poten potentially more of a plant-based diet. Um, now, that's, again, the, the whole other discussion, but we start to look at these different plant-based proteins that are out there. Pea protein is very popular, hemp protein, um, and, and many, many different types. Again, capitalizing on the consumer's interest in looking at more of a plant-based diet. Um, and again, here's, here's some data from, from Inova Market Insights last year, 2016, and look at the rise um, in the different products being launched. So that, that's significant when you look at those number, the number of products that are plant-based products, 656 products uh, compared to just a few years ago uh, to 2011, where there were only 100 different products that were out there. 
So a huge increase over the last several years, when we look at this annual growth rate of plant-based products and plant-based claims associated with those products. Now, if you look at the next slide, the, the question then is, how do plant and animal proteins differ, right? So there's certainly lots of options. And, and one thing that I think we're very, very fortunate of is that when we think about protein as a whole and, and the diet as a whole is each of these foods give us a variety of nutrients, right? And one of those, more speaking, speaking specifically about protein, are amino acids. So we think about animal proteins versus plant proteins as a whole, of course, there are some differences and some outliers, but as a whole, plant proteins are incomplete proteins. They don't have a complete uh, amino acid profile like animal proteins do. When I say animal, of course, it's, it's things like beef and chicken and turkey and fish, et cetera, from, from muscle meat, but then also the kind of the byproducts of those animals. So we have eggs, we have dairy. Um, and, and other, other foods along those lines. So animal proteins offer the complete amino acid profile. Plant, most plant proteins do not. Um, and that's, that's a big differentiator. We'll get a little bit more in depth about that in, in just a second. So the, the most important piece of this is then what are amino acids, right? Most consumers aren't necessarily asking about this, but I think it's an important consideration when we think about um, our overall intake of protein. So amino acids, um, are, are basically what make up protein, right? So we have these different amino acids and each protein has a different amino acid structure. So I often describe them as almost like a chain link fence um, where we have, you know, depending on, on where you're looking at, the, the, the links may be linked together differently to hold that structure together. It's the same thing with animal protein, right? The structure of, of the amino acids within an egg is different than it is within steak or tofu or nuts, for example. Um, so Again, looking at this slide, when proteins are digested or broken down, these amino acids are, are left. And the human body then uses these amino acids to make proteins to help the body grow and repair. And all those benefits of protein I mentioned earlier, um, repair and growth for sure, and certainly performing many other body functions. Again, most consumers think of protein for muscle, right? We build muscle, we repair muscle. But of course, there are many other benefits as well. Um, and then lastly, amino acids can be used as a source of energy by the body, um, not necessarily the most efficient energy source, but they can be used. Um, that's an important piece to, the, to this puzzle as well. So lots of different benefits um, with amino acids. Again, that's why one of the reasons protein gets it such a kind of that health halo because it does so much for our body. Now, I just alluded to this earlier um, in terms of complete versus incomplete, but boiling it down even further than that, um, we, have these, we have a variety of different amino acids in the body. And more specifically, we have essential amino acids. Um, and the, the important piece about this word essential is that our bodies cannot make these amino acids. Um, so we have to get them from the food. Um, and the non-essential is that our bodies can produce the amino acids even if we don't get them from food. So that's an important distinction among those. Um, and then lastly, we have conditional amino acids. And these are not usually essential um, except in certain times of stress uh, or illness. Um, and I'll get into what, what some of those different essential and, and, and uh, non-essentials are right here. So we have as you can see here, there are a number of different essential amino acids, typically nine different amino acids that are essential. Uh, we have a few that are listed as, as non-essential. Again, our, that means our body makes them, so we don't have to get them from the diet. Um, and then you see there's a pretty bit long list of conditional amino acids. Um, as I mentioned previously, those are uh, more specific. Those are usually needed in higher amounts uh, during times of stress or illness. Uh, but in general, those essential ones are the ones we want to key in on because what we need is the adequate proportion of all nine of those essential amino acids gives you a complete protein. Now, going back to what that definition is of complete versus incomplete, we talked about earlier, complete proteins are ones that have those amino acids, um, such as those that we get from animal-based products. Okay, so we have plant protein versus animal protein. Now, we look at this kind of protein package as a whole um, on, on, on this next slide. We have 
protein at the top and certainly look differentiating the differences between animal versus plant. Again, I gave some examples. We have meat, fish, poultry, dairy, eggs under the animal sources. Um, and again, in addition to giving the, there being complete protein sources, they also offer a variety of vitamins and minerals. And you can see just several of them listed there. Of course, there's many, many others that we get from these different foods. Um, in addition to protein. So they're certainly nutrient dense foods. Um, now on the flip side, when we look at plant proteins, we have things like beans, nuts, and grains, all give us protein, different amounts, not complete protein. So again, that means they're missing or low in one or more of the essential amino acids. Um, but it's not to say they're unimportant. Right? They're certainly nutrient dense, so we get a lot of healthy nutrients from those plant proteins as well. Things like those healthy fats. Um, so again, nuts are a great source of a variety of monounsaturated fats, for example. Certainly fiber. Beans are an amazing source of fiber and also give you some protein. Um, again, some vitamins and minerals like vitamin E and magnesium and others. So all of these, these proteins, animal and plant, give us a whole variety of nutrients. Uh, now, again, going back to the amino acids they give us, there's different levels and different quantities in each of them. I always say what we're really fortunate of um, about, especially you know, in, the, in this country, is that we do eat a variety of protein sources. So we're not limited to just one or another, right? So when we do that, we have that combination, we get a variety of amino acids, and that's important. Um, just to kind of show you, highlight some different plant-based sources of protein and how much protein they give you. Uh, per serving. Again, here's uh, certainly not a complete list, but a variety of, of popular and common items. Things like lentils. Um, one cup of lentils gives you 18 grams of protein. Certainly a, a great source, a uh, good source of protein there. Certainly healthy other, many other healthy nutrients as well. Uh, I'm not going to read through every single one of these, but looking at a few different beans, we have white beans as well. Um, I'm going to skip those middle three for a second. Uh, which are complete proteins and go to the other side of the page with chia seeds and quinoa, pistachios are all offer a variety of, uh, of nutrients, including some protein. Um, the middle ones, edamame, tofu, tempeh, um, certainly they are that, that those complete proteins. They offer all the essential amino acids we need in kind of the, the adequate doses. So not all plant sources of protein are incomplete. Okay, there are some that uh, that are complete protein. So these are kind of the outliers. But again, usually we offer, excuse me, we eat and consume uh, a, a few different sources of protein, whether it's the same meal or throughout the day. So when we combine some of those plant sources of protein, we get ultimately a complete protein. We make a complete protein. Now, Looking comparatively, some of the animal-based sources of protein, uh, certainly lots of options here, plain Greek yogurt or, or um, chicken breast, um, certainly seafood with shrimp, certainly whole eggs or, or egg whites, both give uh, protein, uh, or quality source of protein, cottage cheese and pork and lean beef, turkey breast. Um, one thing that, that you see here, these are, higher, these are offering higher amounts of protein, usually for smaller servings um, than the plant-based proteins. Um, the other piece that's important to this is looking at uh, calorie for calorie. Uh, per calorie, we get more protein typically uh, with animal-based sources than we do with plant-based sources. Um, so for example, um, and this wasn't on the last slide, but nuts um, do offer some protein, as I mentioned, but to get the same amount of protein from peanut butter, for example, um, as you would from chicken breast, you would have to also eat a significant amount of calories. Um, so it's not that peanut butter is bad, um, but again, we need to look at the, the calorie content, also the protein content when we're talking to clients uh, and trying to educate on quality sources of protein and what we get, um, kind of the most bang for our buck. So how then do you determine protein quality, right? How do consumers know and understand different protein quality um, from how science determines it, right? Where the, the consumers aren't going into the lab, but you know, consumers are looking at the marketing. And again, we saw a huge rise in plant proteins, as I mentioned earlier. How do they know what they're eating, taking is, is benefiting them? Um, so really the importance and definition of quality varies by category. So you could see you know, consumers' thoughts when, when consumer data are, are taken, 
consumers' thoughts on protein quality uh, can, can vary greatly depending on the food source. You look uh, up at the top, we have with, with beef, you know, certainly fat content is, is talked about a lot and discussed. Uh, freshness, the grade, um, so depending on the grade of beef, hormone-free is certainly a very uh, hot topic right now, and antibiotic-free. Of course, price, at the end of the day, uh, price certainly matters. Um, again, same thing with, with dairy and cheese, hormone-free again comes up. Um, with fish, whether it's fresh, never frozen, is it wild, is it farm-raised, is it sustainably farm-raised? There's lots of different marketing terms that are, that are used um, within each of these products, certainly with chickens and eggs. Again, we have freshness. Always you know, want to make sure our food is fresh in general. Uh, but then again, we have hormone-free, GMO-free, maybe it's a brand-specific thing, brand name, organic, cage-free. Um, with eggs, do they have added omega-3s or other nutrients that are added or higher than, than other brands of eggs? Um, fresh egg in shell um, versus, versus the liquid containers of eggs that you can buy. You know, price, again, comes up again at the end of the day. For most consumers, price is a, is a, a good determinant of what they're going to buy. Um, and again, the, the cage-free thing with eggs, is it cage-free, is it free roaming? Is it, you know, there's lots of different terms that are thrown around. And, and honestly, all of these can be confusing for the consumer. They're not sure what to look for. Um, at the end of the day, the, the, none of these terms necessarily affect the protein content. Right, so whether it's antibiotic-free or cage-free, et cetera, protein content is the same among that. Um, but of course, uh, brands and companies are going to try to use what they can to entice consumers to, of course, turn to their particular product. Now, how does science determine protein quality? Science doesn't care about hormone-free and cage-free and antibiotic-free, what they do um, is they actually use something called the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. That is a tongue twister. Uh, you can see there the acronym. Um, PDCAS is, is typically how it's said. And that's right now, that is recognized by the FDA uh, as the preferred method for measurement of the protein value in human nutrition. Um, so you can see, again, that's, that's the actual definition. You can see the formula uh, below. Um, of how they measure that PDCAS for different protein sources. Um, so, you know, being involved in knowing many different protein researchers, I know it's always exciting to talk about the fecal true digestibility, um, but that is one of the measures when we look at protein quality um, of how, how, how good, so to speak, a protein is or how it ranks in terms of this PDCAS scale. Now, to, to boil that down a little bit further, you can see if you, uh, in the next slide, the, there's a table with the different PDCAS scores of common protein foods. And as you can see here, so one, 1 1.0 is the highest possible score um, on this PDCAS scale. And milk uh, is the, the top, that's what it's on the top of this chart in particular, but there's several that give that 1.0 is the highest number. So milk and whey, uh, so whey comes from milk. Uh, number one, but then we have egg uh, and soy protein isolate and casein. So casein certainly comes from dairy as well. Um, so those first five are all a, a score of 1.0 on the PDCAS scale. And then you can see down the line, um, certainly this isn't a complete list of foods, um, but you can see that obviously your know, beef is high up there. Soy is a little bit lower than that. Key protein, which is a very trendy and popular protein right now uh, among consumers, oat protein, whole wheat, I think that's important to look at when we look at the quality of protein. Um, so yes, you know, very often we'll talk to consumers and say that you can get protein in so many different foods. Like even your whole grain bread has protein. Um, even your oatmeal has some protein. And yes, they do, they do provide protein. So I'm not going to discount that. Um, but in terms of the quality of protein, gram for gram, it's not as high of a quality as some of, those, uh, some of those other sources listed at the top, the milk, whey, egg, et cetera. Um, so that's another important consideration. Um, we're talking to, to consumers and clients about getting a variety of sources of protein. Again, yes, you get some protein from your oats uh, and whole wheat bread, for example, but the quality when measured in that, that, that PDCAS score is not quite as high as, as many other types of protein. And you can see most of the ones listed up there uh, again, are animal sources of protein. Now, 
this isn't the PD cash score isn't certainly the only marker of uh, quality protein. There are other two ways to measure protein quality. Um, you can see one of them uh, is biological value. And the definition that you can read there, biological value is a measure of how efficiently uh, dietary protein is turned into body tissue. You could certainly see the benefit of that. Basically, when you eat your protein, does it give you what you need and does it give your body what you need? Um, and then second is the protein efficiency ratio. Uh, so that's the, the grams of weight, ratio of grams of weight gain to grams of protein ingested in young rats. Um, so depending on the, the research that's, that's being done, um, there's, there's discussion among researchers for what is the best form of, pro or what, excuse me, what is the best way to measure quality protein? Um, there's different, again, as you can see, there's different ways to measure this. Um, so are they're always looking for a better tool as the best way to assess the quality of protein. So here are just a few of the ones that are common. That PDCAS score is the one that, like I said, in the last slide it is recognized by the FDA right now as, as the kind of the premier way. Uh, but there's some discussions. Maybe there's some others as well. Now, when we think about, um, again, I, I gave you the PDCAS scores for a few different proteins. But let's look at some other different options as well. Because, again, maybe one isn't the best. Biological value, um, that is, remember, based on the last slide, how you measure biological value is a measure of how efficiently dietary protein is turned into body tissue. Well, when you look at that then, whole egg leads the pack in terms of biological value um, at 93.7, as you can see. Um, and then you can see the entire list down there. I'm not gonna read through each one of those. Um, again, it's not to say that these other protein sources are, are bad or are not high quality, they're just very, very different. And really eggs are kind of that gold standard amount of, gold standard protein, because they have the, a, a PDCAS score of 1.0. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that is the highest possible. Um, and they, they lead the pack in terms of BV or biological value. Um, so in other words, and, and also in terms of the protein efficiency ratio, a third measure of quality, uh, they're really the, the, the highest of any protein. So shows that, that eggs are really, when we're talking to consumers, a great easy way to get high quality protein. And in terms of, uh, remember cost kept coming up is a lot of, uh, when I was talking about ways that consumers base or judge their quality of protein, eggs are, whole eggs are one of the least expensive, highest quality sources of protein. So it's a win-win when we're looking at consumers in terms of how do you get a high quality source of protein, um, and also not break the, break the bank, um, and eggs certainly uh, provide both benefits. Now, uh, the next question is then how do, when we're looking at what should consumers eat, um, and how protein is calculated on these new nutrition facts panel? Um, well, you can see here, on the, there's a nutrition, uh, picture of the nutrition fact panel. Um, and this is for adult labels, so consider four years and older in this, not that four or five year olds are adults, but it's how they base the labels um, that, that make a specific protein claim. Um, the calculation is so protein grams um, equals the protein per serving multiplied by that PDCAS score that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we also have the percent daily value is listed um, in, in the, on the food labels, and that is protein grams divided by 50 and then times 100. So that's how they calculate protein on the Nutrition Facts panel um, for products that, that to look to make a specific claim. Now, looking at that uh, about for eggs, for example, a whole one whole egg, so when I say whole, again, certainly the yolk and the white together, provides uh, six grams of protein per serving. So multiplying that by the PDCAS score of one uh, gives you six grams, it's very high, some higher math there. Um, and then in terms of the uh, percent daily value, doing that calculation I just uh, highlighted earlier, six divided by 50 times 100 uh, is 12%. So the, the daily value there is 12% um, of the, 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 the serving size of that particular product. So a complete protein will have a, a daily value number that's twice the number listed for the grams of protein. So again, six grams of protein per serving for, this, for the egg, and the daily value is 12% that. So a complete protein that's twice the daily value or twice the number listed for the grams of protein. Now, if you go to the, the next slide, we see that something like a protein bar, which is certainly 
a very, very popular item, item amongst, among consumers. Let's do that same calculation for, um, for a protein bar. And of course, when I say protein bar, there's a variety on the market, but so we have 21 grams uh, of protein times, in terms of the PBCAS score, a little bit lower. Um, so 0 0.67 equals 14 grams. Now for the percent daily value, just that calculation I showed you a minute ago, uh, that uh, total amount of protein per serving, or, or for the, the PBCAS score there, 14 grams divided by 50 times 100 gives you 28% of the daily value. Um, so that's not necessarily, that's not a complete protein in this example. Again, remember it has to be double the amount of the protein per serving. So if it were a complete protein, that percent daily value would be 42%. Um, again, there's lots of different protein bars on on the market and consumers are asking about them all the time, which is better, which is best. That's one way for you as, as, as a health professional um, to, to understand yourself, which would be maybe some of the better choices if a consumer is asking about a particular protein bar. Um, now, then the question becomes, you know, when we look at plant versus animal-based proteins, do they have differences um, in how they impact the physical performance and health. Um, again, we talked about some of the differences between complete versus incomplete, uh, essential amino acids uh, versus non-essential amino acids. So at the end of the day, consumers and clients don't necessarily care about all that, that discussion that, that we do as experts, as, as health professionals, but what they care about are, does it impact my physical, and per my physical performance and my health? Does it necessarily matter? Um, so let's take a look at some of the, the factors that may impact physical performance. So one, uh, we have essential amino acid composition. Um, and again, I talked about what those were earlier. There's nine essential amino acids. Um, and the number two is one I didn't get into yet at all, uh, but one of the amino acids uh, is leucine. Um, now leucine is, is, a, is an amino acid that is, seems to be particularly important. It's one of the essential amino acids. Uh, more specifically, it's also a branch chain amino acid. Um, but between those, the essential amino acids, and then boiling it down even further, leucine as a specific uh, branch chain amino acid may play a role in that overall physical performance. So if you look at this essential, on the next slide, essential amino acid composition. Um, and we have a variety um, here's a, a variety of lists or, or, or proteins on the, on the bottom of the slide here um, and the essential amino acid content. So the essential amino acid composition of a protein source is predictive of its ability to stimulate skeletal muscle anabolism, in other words, building muscle, and that all am essential amino acids should be present in sufficient quantities to stimulate postprandial, so after a meal, muscle protein synthesis. That is a, a big, long tongue twister of a sentence. Um, but in other words, you look at the essential amino acid content of these different uh, foods on the bottom, um, and also compared to human muscle on the very, very right, that dark black graph there. So the essential amino acid concentrations in a variety of protein sources uh, highlighted on this slide. Uh, now, if you go to the next, if you see on the next slide, we have, uh, I mentioned leucine and muscle protein synthesis. So now it's generally believed, remember leucine is one of the essential amino acids, it's generally believed that the leucine content of a protein source is an important and independent predictor of its capacity to stimulate postprandial muscle protein synthesis. And I think that's, that's really important to key in on here. Leucine is one of those amino acids um, that's almost, almost in and of itself seems to be, maybe magical isn't the right word, but have unique properties above and beyond the other essential amino acids. Um, so leucine content within protein plays a huge role, seems to play a huge role in terms of that muscle protein synthesis. Again, what does that mean for the client? Ultimately, muscle protein synthesis can mean over time building or a very, at the very least maintaining muscle. In other words, we want to make sure that we have the essential amino acids and we have a high quality source of leucine consistently throughout the day. Now, of course, it's not just about protein. We think about different plants and animal proteins. Um, there are other differences among them. Certainly the types of fat. 
right? The amount of fat in a, in a, in a steak is different than the fat in beans, for example. Not to say that steak is bad by any means, there's just different types of fat and different amounts of fat in these protein sources. Um, certainly fiber uh, is another big difference. That's one, I think, a big advantage of plant proteins is they also offer fiber, um, which, which animal proteins typically do not do. Um, and then of course, there's other nutrients among all of them. Um, for example, eggs are a great source of choline and vitamin E, um, whereas as other foods, um, provide different vitamins and minerals. Um, and here, specifically outside of the vitamins and minerals, looking at fat content of some of the different proteins. Um, so from, first of all, we have the, the three different types of fat, saturated, unsaturated um, fats, and then certainly omega-3s as a, as a whole other classification. Um, but when we look at this specifically, um, some of the differences among the types of fat. So things like a lot of the animal proteins will have some saturated fat. Um, again, not all of it, but some saturated fat. And that may raise blood cholesterol levels um, and potentially LDL cholesterol levels. And ultimately, maybe that can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, certainly, there are some data to suggest that too much of those over the long haul may also increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. This isn't to say you should never eat those foods that contain some saturated fat, but this is just highlighting some of the, uh, the potential detriments of too much saturated fat and not the balance of other nutrients in your diet. Uh, certainly unsaturated fats, um, there's, you break that down even further into mono and polyunsaturated fats, and those can improve blood cholesterol levels. Um, and also ultimately that could, that could decrease your risk of heart disease. Um, and then lastly, um, getting a little bit more specific to the uh, polyunsaturated fats, we have omega-3 fats. And omega-3s are typically found in fish, uh, some nuts, chia seed, flax seed, some leafy greens all have different types of omega-3s. Um, and then those can lower blood pressure and heart rate. And potentially, they can improve blood, blood vessel function. Um, and then certainly at an even higher doses, uh, may actually lower triglycerides and may ease inflammation. So there's a lot of great data um, on that front. And again, that goes back to, we're talking about fat in this particular slide, but that's why it's important to eat a variety of protein as well, because the different proteins give you different other, other nutrients as well uh, that, that could be of benefit. Now, um, the other benefit to uh, certainly some proteins, plant proteins in particular, as I mentioned, is fiber. The average American does not eat enough fiber. Uh, last data I saw is average American eats around 13 or so grams of fiber per day. Uh, which is about half to a third of what we actually need. You know, why is fiber important? Well, it certainly helps maintain bowel health and digest digestion, uh, can help lower cholesterol levels, and also may help lower blood sugar levels because it helps to slow the digestion of foods. Um, so we cer certainly need to get more fiber in the diet. Beans, as you can see a picture there, an amazing source of fiber, uh, and give some protein. So really beneficial from that perspective. They're also extremely uh, cost effective, so inexpensive. So it's a high quality source of fiber, um, a decent source of protein, but also uh, very inexpensive. So that's a win-win for all. Now, some other, um, again, one of the things that, that fibers and plant proteins, but there's certainly some nutrients that are only in the animal-based foods that we're not getting from some of those plant-based sources. Um, and you can see a whole list here of, of six different uh, nutrients, vitamin B12, uh, vitamin D for sure, which is one that, that many people seem to be uh, not have enough of either in their diet or in their blood when measured, uh, creatine, which is, which is beneficial for muscle strength and health, carnosine, uh, heme iron is really an important one that we don't get from plant-based foods, uh, and taurine. Um, so you can see there, that's another beneficial compound in, in various tissues throughout the body. So again, there's benefits to plant proteins. There's also a lot of benefits to animal-based foods and animal-based proteins because we get all these different vitamins and minerals and fiber and so on from eating a variety of foods in the diet. So let's actually look at some, some dietary guidance on this and plant and animal proteins because consumers are confused. Right, The plant protein trend, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is huge. But what do consumers do? Where do they turn to? What do they look for? Well, 
here's kind of the dietary guidelines for Americans are always a good one to turn your clients on to if they have questions um, or use as a reference point. So about 25% of your plate should be protein foods, okay? So, and I always use this with clients when I'm talking to them on how do you, how do you think about breaking down your plate? Uh, how, it sh how should it be uh, structured to get the right amount of nutrition? Well, so again, about a quarter of your plate should be protein-based foods. And those include all the ones that we mentioned and even more that are listed here. So meat, poultry, seafood, beans, eggs, uh, soy products, nuts, seeds. Again, all of these, as I mentioned, so plant proteins certainly have some benefits. Animal proteins certainly have some benefits, so variety is key. Um, that the variety of protein to improve that nutrient intake and health benefits um, are very important. And certainly, um, one key call out the dietary guidelines is to include at least eight ounces of seafood per week. And again, going back to what I just showed a few slides ago, one of the reasons for that are those very important omega-3 fats. Um, so again, unfortunately, most people don't eat enough of those. Again, but they also give a quality source of protein. So specific call out in the dietary guidelines among the other types of protein are uh, seafood specifically. Now, um, if we look at the, the next slide, the question then becomes is how much specifically of each of those, uh, each of those proteins should we be eating? The dietary guidelines for America give variety of calorie levels, uh, as you can see at the top, and the protein foods from each of the categories within uh, different, different uh, calorie levels. So as you can see here, I'm not gonna read through this entire slide, but basically it gives you different types of protein, excuse me, different protein sources, seafood, meat, poultry, eggs, et cetera, um, and the daily amount of food from each of those groups um, that, that people, they recommend eating per week um, for the dietary guidelines. So again, as you can see here, it goes back to variety. Varying your protein routine uh, is important because of all the different nutrients that we get from those different foods. Now, when we're looking at different, selecting these different protein foods to improve our nutrient intake, um, a couple key call outs here. So choosing lean or low fat meat and poultry, selecting seafood that is certainly rich in omega-3 fats, such as salmon, trout, sardines, and anchovies, I know those are usually everyone's favorites. Um, herring, Pacific oysters, Atlantic and Pacific mackerel. Uh, there are other sources as well, but certainly those are some of the ones that are called out and particularly high uh, in omega-3 fats. Um, some processed meats um, you know, can certainly provide some protein as well. Um, and again, are sometimes an easy source, like I think of deli meats for, um, you know, for, for kids in particular, but certainly for adults taking a sandwich to work or something like that. We need to think about what's realistic for people. Um, and then again, choose, choose unsalted nuts and to make sure you keep sodium lower um, because again, most Americans, it's one of those nutrients that certainly is important, plays a big role in our overall diet and health, but uh, we eat too much of it. So just helping, helping your clients make some of these quality protein choices is important. Uh, now, the question then becomes all that we have, eat a variety of proteins, you understand that. Eat a variety of plants and animal base to get a all the different nutrients you get. But then how do we determine how much protein we need? So on the very left here, we can see the, the RDA for protein, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight for the average sedentary individual. And that is nothing more than to prevent deficiency. Um, but most research suggests that is not necessarily optimal for where we need to be with our protein intake. Um, so, but even then going up a little bit uh, down, down the path here, a little bit higher, 1.1 to 1.4 grams per kilogram of body weight for recreational athletes, um, kind of the, the average person just going to the gym a few days a week, going out for a run or things like that. A um, little bit higher for endurance athletes, 1.2 to 1.4 grams. Again, again, because they're more active, breaking down a little bit more muscle. Uh, and then for strength and power athletes, those numbers go up even higher, up to 1.7 grams uh, per kilogram of body weight. And um, again, I think to give you these values because that's how they're, they're defined in terms of the grams per kilogram. But we often have to remind our clients if we're not doing it for them that to get your weight in kilograms, you divide pounds by 2.2. Um, people ask me that all the time. and I'm sure you get that question as well. Um, but these are kind of the general from research. Uh, research has shown that these are the, the 
recommended amounts of protein for those different types of individuals. Now, what about specifically looking at recovery from exercise? Um, because that's often a popular topic among athletes and just your everyday, uh, even, you know, weekend warrior. What do I need to recover? I just broke down muscle while I was exercising. Now, how much do I need? Um, so here is, is a direct quote from the ACSM and Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics joint position statement. Uh, ingesting approximately 20 to 30 grams of total protein which gives about or 10 grams of those essential amino acids during exercise or the recovery period leads to led to an increased whole body and muscle protein synthesis as well as improved nitrogen balance. Uh, and that's important. So you see this little tiny little graph here in the bottom right. And I think this is really important to call out because um, for a lot of people, again, protein has that health halo and a lot of times people think that some, if pro, some protein is good, then more is better. And that's not necessarily the case. In fact, this particular study, what they did was they gave people different levels of protein and measured how it affected uh, essentially their protein synthesis. So you could see that little slight little curve there. They gave people zero grams of protein. Of course, that didn't affect their protein synthesis. When they gave them 10 grams of protein, that was a significant increase above zero. When they gave them 20 grams of protein, again, that was about double the benefit that 10 grams of protein had. Not surprising, 20 is double 10. And then the researcher said, well, let's give 40 grams of protein because that's, again, double 20. And what they found was there, was there was no significant difference when they went from 20 grams up to 40 grams of protein. Um, that's kind of one of the ways they landed on um, one of the landmark studies that helped them land on that 20 grams as the, as the dose, um, that kind of minimum dose for recovery during that recovery period. So that's an important point of distinction. More protein isn't better. Um, and then the right protein is the best. And then also, when do we eat this? Well, as quick, as soon as possible after a workout. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, the, as the time goes on from your workout, that protein becomes useless. Right, but we do want to have, during that recovery phase, we want to get some protein in. Again, looking at this kind of 20-ish, 30-ish grams of protein, um, but upwards of, you know, up to that two hours after exercise, you want to make sure you're getting some protein in. You just exercised and broke down your muscle. Now it's time to repair, recover, and, and replenish so you can be able to, you're, you can grow, uh, grow that muscle ultimately over time or very, at the very least maintain that muscle. So, how do you then, you're talking to a client, in the next slide, how do you meet your client's dietary protein needs? Well, this slide, this next slide is one of the most important, I think, that, that, that I'm going to even show and highlight, because this is where a lot of the research is starting to head in terms of how do we eat our protein, or how should we eat our protein? I'll start with the right side of this slide first, and this shows the skewed protein distribution which is actually it's skewed, but that's actually the typical kind of American diet. Very, very low protein is eaten in the morning. A little bit more is eaten at lunch. And then the majority of protein is eaten in the evening. And if you think about your own diet or your client's diet, that probably sounds about right, right? Pro the breakfast might be kind of running out the door, maybe grabbing a coffee and a muffin at a coffee shop, for example. Uh, at lunch, potentially a, a sandwich with some cold cuts. You have a little protein there. And then dinner is, is very often centered around that protein meal. So chicken, turkey, fish, whatever it may be. Now, switch gears and look at the left side of the slide. Um, and we have, that's where we have the optimal protein distribution. Now, don't get caught up in the numbers here. This isn't to say that 90 grams of protein is what everybody needs, right? But just look at this, both slides, the left and the right, are, have the same total amount of protein, which is 90 grams, just how it's eaten and distributed is where the difference is. And this side, the optimal protein distribution side of the slide shows an equal distribution throughout the day. So 30 grams of protein at each of the three meals. Now, why is this important? Why does it matter when we eat our protein? Well, one of the meat reasons it matters is that we don't store protein like we do other nutrients. So certainly we store carbohydrates and we store fat. But when we eat protein, our protein is used for what our body needs to use it for. The excess is excreted um, 
but we don't store it in the sense of your muscles don't think, well, thanks for giving me that little bit of protein. I'll be able to use this periodically throughout the day until I get my next dose. So we need to have enough throughout the day to maintain that, that protein synthesis because we want to make sure that we are building and maintaining muscle because unfortunately our bodies are working against us in that case after the ripe old age of 30, we can start to lose muscle mass. So one of the key factors here is making sure we have that consistent protein throughout the day. In this particular study from Dr. Patton Jones and others found that that optimal distribution is really key when we look at protein intake. So that's one message I always like to talk about with, uh, with clients because I think that gets, a lot of people don't think about that. They just think more is better, but not necessarily when I'm eating that. Now, um, again, if you look at kind of a, the sample intake of protein, um, just for a recreational athlete. Now, I mentioned I gave you those values earlier. So for a recreational athlete, about 1.1 to 1.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. Um, for the average female, that would be um, 140 pound female uh, in this example, that would be a little over 75 grams of protein a day, um, which again, is probably a little less than some people think that they should eat. Um, but let's, you know, looking at the research, that's what we kind of need. Um, but again, look at that distribution of that 76 grams. So in this particular example, breakfast, lunch, and dinner have about 20 grams, some snacks that are out there with kind of five-ish grams. Uh, and that gives us, gets us to our dose of that 75, 76 grams of protein for the day. Um, so talking about to your clients about protein distribution is important. The next slide is in a sample diet. Um, again, for what that recreational may look, athlete may look like, the one I just mentioned earlier. A couple different options here for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, nothing out of the ordinary, but certainly thinking about how we can spread that protein out and get different protein throughout the day. Um, some snacks, again, have five, six grams. Again, hard-boiled egg in the morning, certainly an easy one. Some nuts in the afternoon. So what you can see here is a different variety of proteins as well. We have dairy, we have eggs, we have chicken, uh, we have salmon. We have nuts. So getting, again, all across the board, the variety of protein and also the consistent intake of protein. Giving you another example now for someone who needs a little bit higher intake for a, a strength and conditioning or strength and power athlete. Um, again, so we have a 185-pound male here as an example. Remember that dosage is 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram, which puts this individual at about 125 grams of protein per day. Um, Again, his, his per meal uh, intake would be a little bit higher, around 25 grams, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and then his snacks would be a little bit higher as well. And he has that post-exercise feeding um, of around, in this case, around 20 grams, uh, potentially an evening snack as well. So just getting up to the, making sure the consistency is there so he can build and maintain the muscle. Um, so again, keep those values in mind, but in terms of how much people need per meal, um, or per day, I should say, but then also making sure there's an even distribution of that throughout the day. And again, you can look at it, the next slide, a sample diet um, for what this person may be. And once again, there's a variety of proteins offered. Uh, we have eggs, we have uh, some Canadian bacon with string cheese. So we have dairy, once again, eggs, fish, beef, uh, some, some jerky, which is certainly a popular, trendy snack item these days, uh, cottage cheese. So all of them have unique benefits. All of them have a variety of amino acids. Variety is key when we're looking at what to do, how to, how to recommend these foods and diets and so on to our clients. So let's look at some key takeaways from what I covered today. One, complete proteins contain an adequate proportion of all nine essential amino acids. There are nutritional differences in plant and animal-based proteins, uh, therefore, Again, consuming a variety of protein foods is key to improve that nutrient intake. Protein needs certainly vary depending on age, gender, and activity level. Um, and then dietary protein needs can be met through foods, um, even for athletes. Not to say supplements can't play a role, but food first always. Food gives you the biggest bang for your buck. That being said, I want to thank everyone for their time today. Really appreciate you tuning in and, and uh, talking about protein. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I know we got to start a little bit late, so we don't have a whole lot of time for questions, but I will get um, a couple since we did have a lot of participation from the audience, and we appreciate that. So the Great. first question is, uh, you showed a range for determining the amount of protein someone should consume for recreational endurance 
and strength and power athletes. How do you determine which end of the range someone should be in? Hmm, great question. Um, and certainly one, one I get a lot. You know, I think you need to work, each, each client is unique, right? So we need to think about, talk about what, what can work for them. And I, I don't want people to get too caught up in the exact number. So what I would say is, you know, calculate what that range should be. And let's just use the example of it's, let's say, 100 grams per day, um, up to like on the low end, up to 120 grams, for example. Um, so it gives them some flexibility. To, how do we get to that 100 to 120 grams? So it could be, you know, 20 to 25 grams per meal. And here are some options that would give you that. Um, or maybe here are some snack options, some of a little more protein, some of less. So I would offer that range to clients. Um, and kind of let them see what can work for their particular situation without getting very caught up and they need to be at the very high end of the calculation or the very low end. Um, again, give them the range because that range has been shown to just be to work um, for, for, for individuals. Got it. And I'll try to go rapid fire here. We'll try to get at least uh, two or three more in in, our, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, can vegans and vegetarians really meet their protein needs through foods? Oh, very good question. And one I get all the time. And uh, they, so can vegans and vegetarians meet their protein needs? Can they? Yes. Um, in the sense of, can you get enough protein just through the diet from plant only sources? Certainly, as I talked about, it's a lot, it's a lot more challenging. So you have to be really, really cautious about planning your intake to make sure that you have a balanced uh, diet. Um, is it more challenging? Absolutely, right? As I showed you, some of the plant sources give you, you know, protein for sure, but it's a lot less than you would get from animal proteins. You know, that being said, if a vegan comes to me, someone following a vegan diet comes to me, I'm not gonna dissuade them and say, start eating steak, right? Um, but want to make sure that they do plan accordingly to make sure they get a nice variety uh, in their diet to make sure they're getting the amino acids and the protein they need. Okay, and then the last one, again, for the sake of time, uh, will eating more than 20 to 30 grams of protein post-workout improve muscle protein synthesis? Uh, it will, doesn't seem to be, no. At this case, it seems to be that, that, that above that 20 grams, or, or you know, even if you want to go to 30 grams, doesn't seem to, to help. That study I showed you, found that once you are above that 20 to 30 grams, or that 20 grams, excuse me, the benefits seem to just kind of plateau. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean it, it's gonna hurt you. Where, where too much protein can hurt, because I get that kind of a, as a tie on to this question, is it may displace other nutrients in the diet. If I'm eating so much protein, I'm going to be full, um, not necessarily um, have room for the other quality nutrition that I need to get in my diet as well. Got it. Well, unfortunately, we're sort of out of time uh, right now, but what we'll do is, since we've got so many questions that came in through the webinar, um, I will present those to Chris and to the folks at ENC, and we will take those questions and turn them into a blog that we will post on the ACSM website. Um, so everyone that had a question, I promise you, you'll get your question answered uh, at some point. So again, thank you to everyone for attending. As a final reminder, an email with a link to your CEC along with a recorded version of the webinar will be sent out tomorrow afternoon. And then for those registered dietitians, you can also receive CEC credit by visiting the ENC website. So this concludes the webinar. Again, thanks to everyone for attending and have a great afternoon.